our discussion about the fruits. Do they reveal the tree? According to Jesus, they do. And we've been uh, looking at the Roman Catholic Church versus ancient Roman Empire. And we're looking at the fruits. We've looked at the structure. Thus far, we've seen that uh, the Senate um, in ancient Rome elected their emperors. And then eventually there was a military takeover, which pretty much elected the emperors from there on out. We also saw that in the, in the Romish church, they had the Curia. We've seen the, the Vestal Virgins in ancient Rome. The, the, the virgins, essentially, that would join this order of all female monks, if you will. We saw that reflected in the nuns. And many other things that we've discussed. And again, we're talking about the fruits. We're not talking about any Catholic individual, any person that believes anything. We're talking about the institution. We're talking about the institution. Because the institution has produced fruits. We all produce fruits. And Jesus, in his counsel, on what we were to judge, he told us not to judge each other, but to judge the fruits. So if we want to know the source of what something is, we look at its fruits. And if we can see that these fruits are the same, then we know that it comes from the same tree, the same source, right? Now again, I want to say, was ancient pagan Rome a friend of the Christian church? No, absolutely not. Great persecution. So, the Roman Catholic Church, if the fruits are exactly the same, would they be the friend or the enemy of the true Christian church? The enemy. So before we begin, let's have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, Lord, our King, our God, our friend, we come before your throne, Lord, and we ask humbly, meekly, Lord, that you would, you would bless us all with your presence here, that you would help us to understand this topic, that you would reveal things in our minds, things that perhaps we've encountered or experienced or connections we've made in the past in regards to this topic, Lord, we, we pray that you would reveal those things and bring them back to remembrance. Lord, may your ministering spirits be here with us also. Help us, guide us, teach us, Lord. Help us not to rely upon our own reason, our own understanding, but to trust in your word, in the spirit of prophecy as our authority. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So once again, I'm not talking about any individuals. We're talking about the fruits. And we're going to let history show us and the spirit of prophecy show us what the fruits reveal. So our next topic, this is going into specific fruits. We've looked at sort of the, the structure of ancient Rome and seen the connections with modern Rome. Right, the Roman Catholic Church. Now we're going to actually look at some actual actions that have taken place in medieval times and then before that in ancient Rome. Listen to this with the emperors. According to some Roman writers, such as Suetonius, although Caligula started out as a beneficent ruler, he became cruel, depraved, and vicious after he suffered from a serious illness or perhaps was poisoned in 37 AD. Shortly after, he took the throne. He wasn't on the throne very long. He revived the treason trials of his father and predecessor, Tiberius. Did you hear that? He revived the treason trials of his father and predecessor, Tiberius. What does that sound like to you? Trials where people are being accused of something and then murdered? Has the Roman Catholic Church ever had anything like that? The Inquisitions. That's what they were called. And the Holy Inquisitions. And it was considered, fun fact, 
if you were <laughs> if you were considered a heretic it was considered treason against the state and government you imagine that so l let's take an example of that if I believe that the Bible says that when people die they go into their grave and they don't immediately go into heaven that's not the popular belief in the world is it now I'm a heretic for believing that for believing the Bible and what am I being charged with treason against the state see the connection here and this did happen this did happen in the dark age so he revived the treason trials way before this emperor his father and predecessor Tiberius he opened a brothel in the palace raped whomever he, whomever he wished and then reported her performance to her husband committed incest and killed for greed in addition to all that he thought he should be treated as a god does that sound familiar to you do we have sexual depravity in the Roman Catholic Church today yeah. pedophilia now I didn't bring some of that stuff up here but let me tell you if there's things that are not worthy of being repeated in this room right now that emperors have done and that men later that wore the papal vestments have done the same thing the same proofs so I get that from thoughtco.com the top five worst Roman emperors so they thought of themselves as a god they fancied themselves as a god can you pray to the Pope is he called the Lord God Lord God the Pope he's treated as Jesus Christ under a veil of flesh he's the vicar of the Son of God all the, the elements are the same the fruits that's what we're to judge are the same Rodney as you was reading <laughs> I was thinking uh, of a par parallel to that that is actually going on today uh, and uh, if we're faithful and we're alive uh, at the time of the mark of the beast or just before we will also be uh, charged of treason uh, for our faithfulness to the truth absolutely so it's happening yes all over oh yeah and and because it will be a global movement it will be high treason mm -hmm. so we see the same thing we see the same things that have happened already and as once again I want I want to just I just want to remind you about what Solomon said he said he who knows the past knows the future and he who does not know the past does not know the future I'm paraphrasing but that's what we looked at there in uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 1 so in about 950 AD they had a Pope Pope John the 12th the infamous Pope John the 12th and his relationship he was he was he was brought up as a Pope he was one of the youngest popes he may have been the youngest Pope ever to take the throne at I believe age 14 or 16 in his relationship with the church John seems to have been urged toward a course of deliberate sacrilege that went far beyond the casual enjoyment of sensual pleasures it was as though the dark element in his nature goaded him on a te to te goaded him on to test the utmost extents of his power a Christian Caligula is being described here by this author from the bad popes excellent book by the way a Christian Caligula whose crimes were rendered peculiarly horrific by the office he held later the charge was specifically made against him that he turned the Lateran that's his palace into a brothel the fruits are identical that he and his gang violated female pilgrims in the very Basilica of st. Peter his sexual hunger was insatiable it was it was thought that or it was told by another historian that I read that when female pilgrims uh, were coming to Rome they did well to make sure they didn't walk the streets alone because the highest religious authority might come and rape them that's who this individual was and this is the first individual 
to crown a Holy Roman Emperor because his entire, let's call it an empire, that he, that he was reigning over was crumbling before him because of this type of activity. This is a holy person that I need to go seek help from? That I need him to pray for me? Absolutely not. Is this Christian or is this Roman? Looks Roman to me. It's even, it's even stated right here, a Christian Caligula. And you know what? This, I want to recommend this book. It's a, from that, all that, that whole quote is from uh, page 43, I'm sorry, of the Bad Popes. I want to recommend, highly recommend that book because the author is friendly to Roman Catholicism. In fact, I think he is a Roman Catholic. He's merely just reporting on the history. So he's not biased against it. In fact, he's rooting for it. He makes excuses for some of these guys sometimes, which I think that makes it a stronger source because it shows you that even he will say this. So is this, is this the type of behavior that we learn from pagan Rome, or is this the type of behavior we learn from a relationship with Christ and reading his scripture? The fruits tell me that it's pagan Rome. And this isn't like a couple of years, you know. This is, in the, this is in the heyday of medieval times. This is in the noon time, as it were, as Mrs. White puts it, of the medieval times. So this is at the highest extent of their power. So if they ever reach to the highest extent of their power, what, will ha what does Solomon say will happen? These things that we've already seen happen twice. Another quote. From, again, from Thomas Hobbes, Leviathan, chapter 47. Just interesting the way he puts it here. I'm not recommending Thomas Hobbes, but again, just the way, the way he puts this, it's very interesting. For from the time that the Bishop of Rome had gotten to be acknowledged for Bishop Universal, by pretense of succession to St. Peter, their whole hierarchy or kingdom of darkness may be compared not unfitly to the kingdom of fairies, that is, to the old wives' fables in England concerning ghosts and spirits and the feats they play in the night. And if a man consider the original of this great ecclesiastical dominion, he will easily perceive that the papacy is no other than the ghost of the deceased Roman Empire, sitting crowned upon the grave thereof. For so did the papacy start up on a sudden out of the ruins of that heathen power. According to Thomas Hobbes, according to a faithful Roman Catholic, if you will, from the author of the Bad Popes, according to history, pagan Rome was crumbling. We all know of the decline and fall of the Roman Empire, right? But one of the things that made Rome so successful was her ability to adapt, to change. Not to change inwardly, not to change the fruits, but to change her outward appearance. So as the Roman Empire saw, empires weren't very popular anymore. People didn't like the idea. New ideas were floating around about bringing back the republic and things like that. So what did they do? They had to find a way to secure the Roman Empire. So they had to find a new power. And what better power? Think about it. What higher authority can you call upon than to say that you're doing this in the name of God? Who's going to go against that? Now, the ancient emperors who commanded the civil government and also were the highest religious authority in the land with their edicts, right? Papal bulls, edicts, same thing. Now that Christianity was gaining a foothold, they had to switch sides because they were losing. The more they killed the Christians, the more Christianity spread. If you can't beat them, join them. Exactly. So what did they do? They claimed spiritual and temporal authority. The same two authorities that ancient pagan Rome wielded in the past. Isn't that an amazing connection there? 
Paul, you have something to add? Cody, I don't want to take you into another direction. If I am, say so. Okay, and, and I'll stop. But it's interesting that Rome has survived. And I'll tell you why. I've been looking into some ancient history. Every god of every culture, which was far more powerful than Rome prior to Rome, has had an immaculate, amazing city. Uh, even Stonehenge, they know where that came from. That's the smallest of the henges. There's a series of them that follow December 21st as the sun comes down. There's a series of these circles, the main one being off the coast of Wales in 15 foot of water that was destroyed about 4,000 years ago. Krishna, a city, at a, uh, he built a, called an eternal city with golden towers that stretched up to the universe. Mightiest city, mightiest god in the universe, they said, destroyed about 4,000 years ago is in about 20 feet of water in the Indian Ocean. Uh, Atlantis, same thing, mighty God. They know where it is. It's there, destroyed 3,500 to 4,000 years ago. This was through the flood. The Lord wiped these things off the earth. However, why did Rome remain to this day? It's the great controversy, the apostate versus the real, the Sunday versus the Sabbath. And it's a test for God's, why did God let Rome last this long? Why did he let it come up out of the ashes of true Christianity? Or at, because it is our test and we better get our acts together because they will be in power again, the eternal city. All these other cities, I don't know how Krishnas can believe in, her, in, Krish, in this religion because he was claimed to be the greatest, mightiest God. How does this city get destroyed and lost? How did that happen if he was so mighty? But this one is the real deal. This is the devil's seat of power, and we better pay attention. It's interesting that connection you made. Because, and we're, we'll, we're going to get into that in a second, so I don't want to say too much. But you'll see that Rome, one of the things that is, has been such a hallmark of their, their conquering success has been their ability to absorb another religion, to take their rites, to take their festivals, and to baptize them into ancient pagan Rome and add them to their pantheon, or Roman Catholicism to add them to their sacraments and other things. Now, we sort of talked about this a little bit, but the spirit of prophecy shows us how and why, I might add, this happened. In vain were Satan's efforts to destroy the church of Christ by violence. You hear that? That's the great controversy at play. The great controversy in which the disciples of Jesus yielded up their lives did not cease when these faithful standard bearers fell at their post. By defeat they conquered. God's workmen were slain, but his work went steadily forward. The gospel continued to spread and the number of its adherents to increase. It penetrated into regions that were inaccessible even to the eagles of Rome. Said a Christian, expostulating with the heathen rulers who were urging forward the persecution. They said, you may kill us, torture us, condemn us. Your injustice is the proof that we are innocent. Nor does your cruelty avail you. It was but a stronger invitation to bring others to their persuasion. The oftener we are mown down by you, the more in number we grow. The blood of Christians is seed. Um, that's from The Great Controversy, page 41 and 42. And she's quoting from Tertullian Apology in that quote there, paragraph 50. So, Rome was seeing their religion fall to pieces. That's what was happening. Paganism was on its downslope, even though they were still murdering Christians, right? And that's a fruit too, isn't it? Murdering true Christians. Paganism was on the downslope. And Christianity, the more you tried to knock it out, the more it rose. That's what was going on. That's their dilemma. That was their dilemma. This is what brought about the change. Little by little, at first in stealth and silence, and then more openly as it increased in strength and gained control of the minds of men, the mystery of iniquity carried forward its deceptive and blasphemous work. Almost imperceptibly, the customs of heathenism found their way into the Christian church. 
the spirit of compromise and conformity was restrained for a time by the fierce persecutions which the church endured under paganism. But as persecution ceased and Christianity entered the courts of palaces and kings, she laid aside the humble simplicity of Christ and his apostles for the pomp and pride of pagan priests and rulers. And in place of the requirements of God, she substituted human theories and traditions. Imagine that. The nominal conversion of Constantine. What does nominal mean? Didn't really happen, did it? In name only. In name only. The nominal conversion of Constantine in the early part of the 4th century caused great rejoicing. And the world, cloaked in, with a form of righteousness, walked into the church. Now the work of corruption rapidly progressed. Listen to this. Paganism, while appearing to be vanquished, became the conqueror. Her spirit controlled the church. Her doctrines, ceremonies, and superstitions were incorporated into the faith and worship of the professed followers of Christ. So in order to save paganism, paganism put on the cloak of Christianity. That's exactly what happened. And Mrs. White says, though she appeared to be destroyed, she gained her greatest foothold in this time period. That's from The Great Controversy, page 49 and 50. Rodney? It's called Divide and Conquer. Divide and Conquer, yes. Absolutely. And, you know, we can, for the sake of time, I, I can't show you all these, all these quotes to prove everything that I'm going to say, but you study history, and you'll see that these, the temples, the statues themselves, that were once pagan, were just remodeled and okay well you can keep all the same stuff but now this is a feast to Jesus or Mary or somebody else they kept even the same temples the same altars the same priests were baptized and turned into Christian priests Catholic priests paganism though appearing to be vanquished walked right in through the front doors of the church and took up residence and we had something different we didn't have true Christianity anymore. Well, look at what is happening to our church. The same thing they did there, they have infiltrated our churches. You know, that's why the Jesuit order was created for. You know, it's, it's difficult to walk into a true Adventist church. Yes. Difficult. You know, I remember back in the 90s when I came back, and I walked into a church and said, what is this? I had to walk out and I kept walking out, kept walking out until I found a conservative one. And now that conservative one, which I left back in 2007, six, is a celebration church. Wow. The world, once again, and we, are, we aren't to judge these people, no. right? But we can judge the fruits. In fact, we are implicitly told to do exactly that. If you see the world in your church, we're looking at, we're looking at ancient Rome and the Roman Catholic Church. But, you know, you take this and you take the world and you put any church next to it. And if you see the same things going on, you're in the world. You're not in the church. Madeline's got something to add. I, I think what comes to mind is creeping compromises with this whole ecumenical movement. It's happening so stealthy before our very eyes yes. that even for those of us who study, we often, when we go outside our comfort zones, we often don't see it taking place. Um, with the Bibles, with e even in, in Ellen White's writing, you see some, some um, interpretation of it or misinterpretation of what right. she says. Absolutely. So these very things are happening before our, our eyes. If we don't keep our eyes open prayerfully, not of ourselves, yes. but through prayer and the Holy Spirit in us, we fail to see these things.
almost imperceptibly. And the, the, the concessions, the compromises that one generation does make but refuses to make this one, they won't do that, the next generation will make that one. But, but that should open our eyes to the times we're living in now. Because that's not what's going on. It's not little by little. It's not every 50 years something happens. We have seen drastic changes take place in the last 10 years among all the churches, but especially in Seventh-day Adventism. And it's through this ecumenical movement. And it co connects directly with prophecy. Where was the woman that John went to go see? The angel took, took John to see the, the whore, right, the, the harlot. And where was she? She was in the wilderness. She wasn't out in the open. These things are done behind closed doors. These things are done in stealth, almost imperceptibly. They're wrapped in a package that makes it look like this is a good thing. But if, but if we don't study our history, we won't know our future. Rodney? She is a chameleon. Uh, it's That's a, a perfect it's example. Art. It's yeah. an art. It's a science. Uh, we're told that we have more to fear from within than without. Alberto, the uh, Jesuit... Uh, uh, the ex-Jesuit priest, yeah. He, Alberto yeah, he, Rivera. Uh, he said the Seventh-day Adventist Church was the first church. First one. The first one that they infiltrated. Now, me as a military individual, um, and Paul, I'm sure... He had to do armor ID and all sorts of different engagements and things like that. When you are out on the field and you're scanning and you're, you're, you're looking at where your enemies are. Oh, I'm sure you've done this too. They teach you this too. The first one that you, you choose to make engagement, if you have more than one option, is the one that's most threatening. You have to take down the biggest threat first, don't you? You don't take down something that's a minor threat. If you have, like, let's say, like you're in a tank, and you have somebody with a rocket launcher six feet from you, and you have a guy with an AK-47 a mile down there, you don't shoot at the guy with the AK-47 first, do you? You've got to take out this, this RPG team. So that shows right there. Who was the first one, according to Alberto Rivera, that was infiltrated by the Roman Catholic Church? The Seventh-day Adventists, which tells us that they were the biggest threat Amen. That's what I was going to say anyway. Um, we see the same thing happening in all churches. Yes. Uh, I don't believe that there is an organized church out there today that has not been infiltrated. Absolutely. Absolutely. And we, we can know that. There are quotes... Alberto Rivera is another one that there's, a, there's quotes we can see that that information has been given out. But again, if we just judge the fruits, we can come to that conclusion without, without any study at all. Paul? You know, it's interesting you use that analogy. And in combat, and civilians don't understand this. Friendly fire, killing troops of your own kind. And there's a big outrage now. Well, it happens. Because of what you said, identifying the enemy which is why we have to be so careful and why Jesus gave the uh, wheat and the tear uh, story that we don't turn on one another. We need to keep focused on present truth, spreading the third angel's message. That's it. And let the Lord worry about who's a Jesuit, who isn't, who's this, who's that. We need to be about our father's business and there'll be no friendly fire. You know, everybody's seeking today, I see these independents with all these wonderful sermons and prophecies are destroying people left and right within our ranks. With the health message, they're destroying people. Mrs. White said, beware. We have one mission, to be the best Christian we can be and keep the Sabbath holy. That's the test. So that analogy is so important. Let's stop looking at each other and see whose head we're going to take off because you don't want to be destroying somebody who God has separated out as one of his own. I don't want to be there on that day of judgment. Got to keep our eyes on Christ. Amen. Got to keep our eyes on Christ. It's imperative. Now, another, another direct, historically, easily proven fruit that you can find um, 
between the Roman Catholic Church and ancient pagan Rome was their absorbing of paganism. And we've talked about that briefly. Uh, from ancient history encyclopedia on Roman religion, from the beginning, Roman religion was polytheistic. From an initial array of gods and spirits, Rome added to this collection to include both Greek gods as well as a number of foreign cults. Hear that? They just added them to themselves. That's all. They conquered these nations, and it's very smart. It's very smart what they did. Think about it. You're conquering a nation that serves different gods. They think their gods are fighting against each other, but you say, no, I accept your gods. Now we're the same religion, aren't we? Do you see anything like that going on today? We have a thing called the World Council of Churches. And it's not just Christian churches. It's all religions. And who's at the centerpiece of all that? The Pope. Madeline's got something? Well, frankly, that's the core of the ecumenical movement. And that whole phrase of, we're all Catholics. Yes. You know, that, that was subtle. Seventh-day Adventists were saying that, too, as if it was a joke. You know, we're all Catholic. And inviting, I call them foreigners, to their pulpit, you know, preaching. And, and, and it was as if it was a joke because we have the truth. And here we have our, our, our pastors, Seventh-day Adventist pastors, inviting Baptist preachers and Catholic preachers preaching to preach on their pulpit. And, and, and interestingly enough, before the foreign preacher would speak, they would say, I never, I never thought that day would come for me to speak in a Seventh-day Adventist church. What is that? It's, it's a joke. What is that telling us? Absolutely. It tells us that we're the same religion. That's what it tells us. Because you don't have someone with a diametrically opposed religion come and speak at your... So one of the things ancient Rome did was she took everybody's religions and put them under her umbrella and said, guess what, guys? We're the same religion. And they said, okay, good. We can have peace. So what's Roman Catholicism doing today? She's taking all the church. Looks like a good thing, doesn't it? World peace. No more holy wars, right? Everybody's coming under the same umbrella. And, and, and because Catholic means universal, everyone's Catholic, right? She's doing the same thing. It's, this, it's a playbook. It's not some new thing that's happening. It's a playbook. It's been done before. And it was the reason for their success. Where Babylon failed, Babylon tried to get them to adopt their customs. They would tra trade out nations. They would take half of their people, bring them to Babylon. They'd take half of their Babylonians, put them over there so that they could intermingle. Alexander the Great, he changed the language. He put everybody under the same language. He, he, he showed, he paid homage to the other gods, but he never stopped worshiping his own gods. Rome saw all these things. They learned from them. And they said, no, we can't just pay homage to their gods. We have to accept their gods and start worshiping their gods on a daily basis like them. We have to take their rites. We have to take their festivals. And we have to absorb them. That way we all have the same religion. Very, very successful. There was the longest lasting empire this world has ever seen other than perhaps the antediluvian world, which we're, we're, we don't have the history for. Rodney? In Jesus' prayer, when he prayed that we all would be one as he and the Father are one, this is Satan's counterfeit. Because they're, they're saying we're one. We're coming together as one. But it's a counterfeit. They came, they're coming together as one just as they did at the Tower of Babel. Just because people come together, it doesn't necessarily mean it's a good thing. People, can, people come together all the time to do very evil, wicked things. People come together to fight wars, um, the Holocaust, things like that. Great number of people came together to accomplish that goal. But they're not one as God would. They're not, but they're not one in spirit and in character, the way Christ wants us to be. As the empire expanded, the Romans refrained from imposing their own religious beliefs upon those they conquered. However, this inclusion 
must not be interpreted as tolerance. This can be seen with their early reaction to the Jewish and Christian population. So, essentially, they were nice to you if you were pagan, but if you worship God, the true God, they didn't like you. That's a fruit, folks. As the empire expanded across the Balkans, Asia Minor, and into Egypt, Roman religion absorbed many of the gods and cults of conquered nations, but the primary influence would always remain Greece. That's why the prophecies talk about it having the body of a leopard, because a lot of their influence, Plato, Aristotle, Socrates, all those, their, their philosophies, their religion at its core, Greek. So, here, the ancient priest of the god Dagon of the Philistines and Tyre, you have a certain outfit here, right? With the fish head on top. Open mouth fish head. And that's in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3. That's not in there, is it? That's, that's, that's directly pagan. So what is this doing on his head? Where, where, is, where is the sanction for this in the Bible? It doesn't exist. And again, I'm not, I'm not picking on them. I'm saying, look, they're the same thing. They're the same thing. This, is this inspired by God? Is this inspired by Christian? Or is this inspired by pagan roots? It's inspired by pagan roots. It's baptized paganism. That's what it is. The symbols. This is for the Babylonian or Assyrian sun god, Shemesh. He has the Maltese cross there and a solar wheel of sorts. You see that here on Pope John Paul II. The Maltese cross is a variation of that. The solar wheel here in St. Peter's Square, we have the solar wheel. And that's in First Thessalonians. That's not in there either, is it? You know, Samhain, all these festivals fall on their solar wheel days. You know, the equinox, the, the solstice. It's sun worship. So right here, this is a wheel of sun worship. This is a wheel of Christ... Right? It's ridiculous to even say that. This is, a, this is sun worship also. It's the same. It's inspired by the same thing. The fruits are the same. The fruits are the same. And they, they, it's insulting. This is insulting, folks. Because they're putting it right in our face. And they're saying, we're Christian. Your actions tell me otherwise. Have you ever heard the saying, I I'm sorry, I can't hear what you're saying over your actions? Yeah. Right. It's the same, it's the same fruits. So the tree is the same also. Is this... What you do speaks louder than what you say. Absolutely. That's why it's so important for us to be a good witness to others, isn't it? Because we can, we can preach to them all day, but if we're living like Babylonians, they're not going to listen to us. Actually, we'll probably push them further away. So these fruits, they're identical. They're the same. Sun worship. Sun worship from the Encyclopedia Britannica. During the later periods of Roman history, sun worship gained an importance and ultimately led to what has been called solar monotheism. Nearly all the gods of the, of the period were possessed of solar qualities, and both Christ and Mithra acquired the traits of solar deities. You ever wonder why you, every time you see a, a, a medieval painting of a saint, they got the sun disk behind them? It's not a halo. It's a sun disk, because it's sun worship. The Feast of Sola Invictus, the unconquered sun, that's the god that Constantine worshipped, by the way. That's the reason why he implemented his own Sunday law at, the, uh, at um, uh, the Edict of Laodicea, I believe. On December 25th was celebrated with great joy, and eventually his date was taken over by the Christians as Christmas, the birthday of Christ. Do you see that? Is this more clear now? Who are we honoring? Are we, you know, we're just changing his name. It's still Sol Invictus. It's still the sun god. But we're just saying, now you're Christ. And it's your birthday. 
and not the Feast of Sol Invictus. It just happens to be on the same exact day and the same exact pomp and the same exact worship ceremonies and the same exact rites, but it's Christian now. Does it work like that? What did God tell his people to do to the temples and to the altars of the Canaanites when they conquered them? Destroy them. I don't want you, I don't want you offering burnt offering sacrifices to me on their altars where children have been murdered. Yet, in this time period, temples, pagan temples were taken over. Who knows what kind of atrocities had occurred there? And they were rededicated to Christ. What a slap in the face to our Lord. Look, this is, this is, a, this is a statue of the mother goddess in paganism, or, or Mary. What's she holding? She's holding the sun. Is that supposed to be Jesus Christ? I mean, how do you even spin that? She's holding the sun. This is, this is Catholic. You have, the, you have the cross of Christ, and you have the sun with the face. That's Sol Invictus. That's who that is. It's sun worship. You're going to tell me? I mean... <laughs> You can go on and on and on. Go to any, go any cathedral you want to. See, look up this stuff online. You will find picture after picture. Sun, 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 sun. The wafer, it's a piece of bread, but they shape it like a solar disk. Why? The sun, the sun, the, it holds the wafer. You're going to tell me this is not sun worship? The symbol for the Jesuits is the sun. This isn't sun worship? Is this, is this Roman religion? Is this ancient Roman religion? Or is this Christianity? This is ancient Roman religion, folks. See, I can stand up here all day. I can stand up here all afternoon. And if you guys are willing to sit here, I will, I will continue to stand up here going into Sunday. And I can tell you that this is not a duck. We can, we can hear it quack, and I can say, nope, that's still not a duck. <laughs> it does swim. It does have the same diet as a duck, but it, it's not a duck. We can take DNA tests, and we can see that the DNA test says that this is a duck. Well, DNA test is wrong. You guys can trust me. But you guys know that this is a duck. You have to be dumb. To right? It. Just because I say it's not doesn't make it true. So if they say this is not sun worship, but the fruits, which is what we're judging, clearly show that there's an inspiration behind this, there's a certain spirit guiding this, and is it the worship of the true God, or is it Sol Invictus' spirit? You know, hold on, hold on one, one second, Samuel. You know what's interesting? That last one with the eye... HS. There was a huge, huge Seventh day Adventist choir that had those initials printed on their choir garments. So, what, who were they giving worship to? And I was like, wow, really? This is how far we have come. And it's sad. Yes. And Satan doesn't care if you're doing it on purpose or if you're worshiping him due to willful negligence. Because the information's out there. It is willful negligence. At some point, it has to be. Rodney? They take the IHS and make it say, in his service. Yes. Instead of Isis, Horus, and Seth. Who are pagan gods. Absolutely. Sun gods, yes. actually. Isis can be a sun god or, or the moon. But Horus is definitely the sun god, and Seth's the god of evil. The God of the underworld. Where's, where's the most high? Where's, where's, the, where's the God of the Bible in there? Where is the scriptural precedence for this stuff? It doesn't exist. It comes from the conquered pagan temples that they took over and baptized into Christianity. Paul? The, I, the IHS uh, was a choir that came from Sligo in the 80s. I knew somebody who sang with them who quit because of that. They were prominent through the 90s, but it came from Sligo. 
And I knew an uh, incredibly talented uh, lady who sang, and she quit. And uh, yeah, pretty amazing. Yeah. But uh, yeah, this is all collected from Cain all the way up. Every pagan symbol and emblem got put into Christianity. I think about it. When you, when you don't, and I know me and Paul have talked about this uh, years ago. When, when you don't have the true God in your life, you begin to look for something else to worship. So isn't it, isn't it sort of ironic that when you're in darkness, you worship the brightest thing that you can find, which would be the sun? So, as you can see, we have Babylonian sun worship. You have the half crescent moon there, and then the sun inside it. Islamic temple, you have this right here the half crescent moon with the sun inside it, you know, the worshiping of, of the sun, the moon, the stars, and the host of heaven that it talks about in the Bible. Right here, Egyptian, you have the half moon with the solar disk inside it and the, the pagan trinity in there. And of course, the eye of Horus. The Ro Roman Catholic altar, modern altar, with Mary and the sun disk on her chest. And what's that? It's a crescent moon. And how, how is this styled? What are these angels doing? And what is this chest? This is blasphemy, folks. That's the, this, is, this is a nod to the Ark of the Covenant mingled with paganism. This is mixing the profane and the holy together. In the, in the moon strands, where the, where the wafers are held, obviously, clearly, this is a sun. But what holds the little, what holds the little wafer? A little half-crescent moon. Why did they build it like that? They built it like that because that is where they learned it from. This isn't Christian. This is the polar opposite of Christianity. This is heartbreaking to me. So, go over a couple more things, other th things we haven't really mentioned, or perhaps maybe we have a little bit here and there. In ancient Roman Empire, you have the celibate priesthood of Mithra with Semiramis as its origin. You have celibate priests in the Catholic Church. You have, it's a civil and religious power. It's a spiritual temporal authority. Uh, it conquered, then adopted religious customs, adopted pagan rites. Authorities in the priesthood, men, teachers, philosophy, Tradition is equal with scripture in the Catholic Church. Sunday worship uh, is the day of worship for the ancient Roman Empire, especially for Constantine, who created the first Sunday law after becoming a Christian. They changed the Sabbath to Sunday in the Catholic Church. Festivals to pagan gods, same, same dates, same festivals, same rites in the festivals, but now they're to Christian-inspired uh, persons. Hades, the place where everyone went to burn for eternity, the doctrine of hell came from the Catholic Church. The emperor was infallible. Anything he did was right, correct, and everyone had to, do it, had to um, follow suit. The Pope is infallible, according to the Catholic Church. They persecuted Christians. They fed them to lions in the Colosseum. They persecuted and killed Protestants. There was paranoid massacres, such as the terrorism, terrorist attacks, fires, and things like that being blamed on the Christians by Nero, one of the emperors of Rome. And we have things like the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre, where, when the bell tolled at midnight, and 70,000 or more, as Bill puts it, of the very flower of France were destroyed. And I can't wait to meet them. Um, Ancient Roman Empire had its imperial order or its edict. Catholic, they have their papal bull. Uh, there was opposing emperors in the history of the ancient Roman Empire. Maximus, Maximinus was one of them. There was sometimes two or three fighting for the throne at the same time with their own armies. Uh, it sort of started out that way. I mean, Julius Caesar against Pompey. Uh, Pompey wasn't really going for emperor, but, you, but there's, there's been many times where there's been one or two, sometimes three so-called emperors 
Because after one dies, the army selects the next one, and they might be way over in the east, but the other western army says, no, this guy's the new emperor, and they end up fighting. Well, you have the anti-popes. You have a pope that sold, <laughs> sold the papacy to another individual and then came back to reclaim it. You had two popes at the same time. We have two popes at the same, same time today. Benedict the 16th, right? And Francis, they're still alive. They're not competing, but two or three at one time. And the black pope. And the black pope also, good, good connection made there. Um, in ancient Roman Empire, you had mystics in witchcraft. You had the secret religion of the elites, all right, where they practiced witchcraft and they, they listened to mystics. Just one example in the Catholic Church, they're known as mystics. They're actually called that. They're called the Desert Fathers. They used to take drugs and make themselves sweat and everything, kind of like the Sioux Indians used to do, so that they could have visions. Where is that in the Bible? This is, this is 100 or so years after Christianity had established itself. Emperor was God on earth. We have the Lord God, the Pope, according to the Catholic Church. God on earth, wielding... Uh, temporal and spiritual authority for the entire world. I think we're going to stop right there. We have a few more um, slides to get through. And this seems like a good stopping point. But I hope you guys can see, just from the, the, the very small amount of history research that has been done here in this presentation, that it's so clear, folks. It's so clear that the spirit, that the, the tree is the same from ancient pagan Rome to the Roman Catholic Church empire that exists today. And if we aren't careful, and if the world isn't careful, we're going to get sucked into its trap. Because if we don't know our history, as Solomon puts it, we will not know the future. May we learn from our history. We've seen it happen twice. It's going to happen a third time. The persecution is going to return. We're going to have to make a choice. Are we going to stand upon the scriptures? Are we going to stand upon the spirit of prophecy? Are we going to stand with Christ? Are we going to, are we going to amass under the peace and safety black banner of Satan himself? We all have great decisions to make. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much that, that you gave us such a, a beautiful test, such a simple test that we can, we can see, that we can discern whether a power, an institution, is our enemy or our friend. Lord, may we learn from the history that you've, you've preserved from the scripture and the, the principles that are in there that we can see, Lord, the things that are going on around us today and see that all these things have happened before. There's nothing new under the sun. Lord, the connections that have been made, they're not offshoot connections. These are, these are the blatant, in-your-face fruits. These powers are the same. And these, by these simple tests, we can test even our own churches. That if we see the things of the world, the fruits of the world in the church, we can know that that is a church of the world. Lord, please be with us the rest of this day. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.